when Joshua led the children of Israel over Canaan, coming from the east and going to the west, they crossed the Jordan River. The instructions from God was that the priest bearing the Ark of the Covenant should go into the river, into the midst of it, in their stand, bearing the ark, until all of Israel, that's thousands upon thousands of people, all they had, had passed over into Canaan land. I remember one of the first sermon books that I ever read was J.W. McGarvey's sermons that he delivered in 1893. And he made a sermon out of that, and it's quite good for what I want to do today. The priests, the Levitical priesthood, under the law of Moses, were essential if Israel was to approach God and worship Him acceptably. They were the ones that were instructed in a certain way to bear the Ark of the Covenant. Now notice the Ark of the Covenant. It means God has a covenant with these people. Not long before this, before the death of Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, Moses had reminded those people that our God made a covenant with us, not with our fathers, but us. There are all of us alive here this day. That covenant we know as the law of Moses, and we call it the Mosaical Age because the Jews, descendants of Abraham through Jacob and his sons, who came into being a nation while in slavery in Egypt was delivered by Moses, their wilderness wanderings, and now after 40 years, and all those 20 years old and upward, but Caleb and Joshua are dead, having wandered in the wilderness, dying there because of sin. They've now come to this place to enter into the promised land. A land flowing with milk and honey. A place of rest. A place where they could be their own and call it home. Like so many things in the Old Testament, it is a type of things to come. We even have a song that says, I won't have to cross Jordan alone. Or, on Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. And then we announce in the song, we shall rest in that land. So when you see Joshua doing as God told him, and the children of Israel ready to cross. If you read the text, you'll find that the river was out of its banks. It was flooding. It wasn't a pleasant, pleasing sight to see when you're told, walk across that. Well, it was between them and their rest, their promise. And for many, many years they had longed to be there. But there was a covenant God made with Moses, as I've said. And the Ark of the Covenant reflected that. Remember on top of the Ark of the Covenant, there was the mercy seat with the cherubims bending over it, their wings touching. Once a year in the worship, the high priest would go in and sprinkle blood on that mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. For his sins and the sins of all the people, all of that pointing to the day when Jesus, the Lamb of God, would come in his being and save us from our sins by dying on the cross and shedding his actual blood. And as that sacrifice, he would actually ascend into the actual most holy place of heaven itself before the Father. All these things typify those things. And thus there's typology here. None of us know what it's like. That is, we haven't experienced dying. We can read in the scriptures where James says, 
that the body apart from the spirit is dead. And we can know that's as good a definition as you need. The spirit is also known as the inward man. You've heard me say it many times. I call it the real you. Because God Father did, according to the Hebrews writer. And it made you what you are and you're different from any other human that ever lived. You have a spirit within you that will always be. What we do with our bodies here and what we learn and how we live determine ultimately and finally, eternally, where we shall reside in eternity. But right now I'm speaking of brethren who love the Lord, who keep His commandments, who yearn for heaven. So it's interesting that when you read the account, that when the priest approached that water bearing the Ark of the Covenant, as soon as their feet touched the roaring river that was Jordan at that time of year, the water ceased there. And the water ran on off. And they stood in the midst as all Israel passed over. Because God made a covenant with them. God had promised them and they were standing on the promises. And they could not be hurt of that river that separated them from their promised land. Now I've noticed James saying, the body apart from the spirit is dead. And we could turn over and read about the rich man and Lazarus and talk about the spirit leaving the body. Still being its own personal entity, conscious, realizing who people are. I don't know how that people recognize one another in spirit form, but they did. Even people who had died hundreds and hundreds of years before folks had entered, such as the rich man, recognizing Abraham, they recognized one another. But I don't trouble myself with those things. It is God that put them all together. And any being that can speak something into being out of absolute nothing is, has my vote as to him taking care of me and performing the promises that he's made to me if I'm in love with him with all my heart and faithful to his cause. And thus all Israel passed over, not fearing the flood, and went over to possess the land of promise. When I read in the New Testament the Apostle Paul, I see him writing to a church that was very dear to him because of their love of God and faithfulness, service, and helping him. And I see him saying in chapter 1 and verse 21, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. In other words, it's profitable for a faithful Christian to die. It bothers me and has all my life that people who say their eternal home is in glory in a resurrected body like the Lord now has is in heaven, but they didn't really talk about heaven much except when they sing a song. You realize that? That most of the time we speak of heaven when we're in the worship and somebody selects a home about heaven. How many times do you talk about heaven outside the worship assembly? You're only going to be there forever if you're saved. Here you're just a blink of the eye and it's gone. James also tells us, you see, that life in the flesh is like a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Well, some of us are maybe closer to vanishing than others due by reason of time, but we're all just one heartbeat away from eternity. I don't care how young or old you are. But Paul says for me to live is Christ. In other words, to be here on earth, the most important thing about anything is to live like Christ wants me to be and to think like Christ wants me to think. He even says we're to set our affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Think about the things the Bible says we ought to think about. But then he says in verse 22 of Philippians 1, But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose I will not, for I must straight. That word, S-T-R-A-I-T, it's a stricture. 
uh, uh, drawn between the two. You know, sometimes we'll say about something, well, one moment I'm looking forward to it, the next moment I'm not, or one moment I'm getting ready, and I have sort of a, a pull on me. Well, Paul says, I'm a straight betwixt two. Having a desire to depart and be with Christ. Why is that the case? Which is far better. Yet he says in verse 24, Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Then he says, Now having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. Well, being an apostle of Christ, he had insight into things that we wouldn't through the Holy Spirit. And he knew he would be there a while longer doing what God called him to do as an apostle. After all, he says this in a letter he's writing to the church of Philippi. But the point I want to emphasize here for us is that should we not yearn for heaven as Paul did? You remember that he makes it very plain and he's very solid when it comes to his um, hope of glory, his expectation of salvation in glory. When he wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says, I am now ready to be offered. And the time of our departure is at hand. I think the greatest statement a person could ever make truthfully is for I am now ready to be offered. And we don't know when our departure is is coming. It may very well be before the day's over. He knew that it was upcoming shortly. He says his departure's at hand. And I like the fact that he talked about the departure. You go out here to the airport, and you look up there and you have arrivals and departures. And that's the way he viewed it. It's the idea that he's going to, as we sing in the song sometimes, wing his way to glory. There's a certain time which we all must depart. But notice we depart. We don't go out of existence. We don't cease to be. We don't go unconscious when you go to the airport and you watch somebody leave, they depart. You know that same person you were just with is somewhere else being just what they were because their person's there. And when you ever take a plane trip and you get on the plane and you're visiting with folks or whatever before you leave, but it's at home or at the airport and you get on that plane, it departs. And you leave all that far behind, but, but you're going. You're there. You're winging your way through the air, headed for another landing. Well, notice what Paul said. I fought a good fight, and I finished my course. I have kept the faith. Now, Paul never considered himself to be flawless, but he was faithful. He said that this one thing I do, I press forward toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He said, I put behind me those things. Uh, that would be good and bad that he had done because I can't go back and change those. I can't in my mind resolve what will be from now on out, but I, I can't change. No matter what good I did, I can't change that. No matter what bad I did, I can't change that. But I'm still the same person. And he knew at the end of his life because he says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them that love is appearing. That love is appearing. Now he switches off of his immediate death to the end of time when the Lord returns. And he talks about his appearing. We know most people today living for themselves and living for this time period and building after the flesh are not anxious to see the Lord come back. Not if they know his infallible word and what it means. We can see that in his teaching. When you look at what Paul had to say to the Thessalonians, he said in first or second Thessalonians chapter one, verse seven, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. But then watch what it says about the church, the saints. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints, and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed, 
in that day. So the most people aren't going to be ready for the Lord to come. Because they haven't taken advantage of what the covenant of Christ, the New Testament, teaches concerning how one's saved from sins, how life is to be lived in the flesh, and how everything here is just passing. They live it rather as if this is the way it's always going to be, and while death is in their mind, it's always for somebody else and a long way off from them. Well, I wonder yesterday how many people were thinking that way. Today, they're in eternity, totally unprepared to meet their God. What we have mostly said in the New Testament about these things has to do with the Christian who dies faithful. Or as this is said in 2 Thessalonians, comforting them because of those who have persecuted them and rejected the gospel and lived according to their own will. Consider with me Paul in his writing to the Corinthians. I'll begin with 2 Corinthians, but I'll end up in 1 Corinthians. This is one of the very beautiful passages because he's talking about seeing beyond the spirit separated from the fleshly body and in the spirit state. And he sees the resurrected body. And remember, it's John who says, we do not know what we shall be like, but we shall be like him when we see him as he is. And here he writes to the brethren and says, for we know, I always like things that begin that way, for we know. That's solid. You can sink your teeth into it. You can stand on it. It won't fall apart. For we know, if our earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Well, we know something. Well, we have an earthly house. He says of this tabernacle, the Greek word is skene. It simply means a tent. Now, that's how Paul viewed this fleshly body. You don't permanently, as a rule, dwell in tents. They're temporary abodes. So this body is a temporary abode that's going to dissolve, if you please. Well, what do we look to? Well, we look beyond the place of disembodied spirits. And we see a building of God. Notice how it switches from temporary to something solid. And who built it? It's God's building. We have a building of God. Notice it's not made with hands. We get our bodies from our mother and daddy. All must return to the earth from which it came. Not so with the house not made with hands. There's a song somewhere. It's in our book. Beautiful place. The house not made with hands. And it's eternal in the heaven. Eternal means no ending, but it's more than just duration. It means quality of existence. That's what eternal life is. It's not just unending while well, they're unending in hell. That's not life. It's a quality of life. They exist in hell and terrible torments. Eternal life can only be applied to those resurrected from the dead and in heaven. Eternal life, the quality of life of the person in heaven in the glorified resurrected body. I can't begin to explain that. It's just not there. I don't think our minds can grasp the glory and majesty, power, and honor that's bestowed upon us when we're resurrected. But notice how he turns back, sort of sounds like him in Philippians. And he talks about this, this tent, this skene, this temporary dwelling place. For in this we groan. Well, Paul had a lot to be groaning about that had nothing necessarily to do with this, the flesh. If you look back earlier in chapter 5, or rather chapter 4, after pointing out the gospel, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. He then talks about what they underwent in their faithful service to God. We're troubled on every side. Yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, 
but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So, he says, then death worketh in us, but life in you. Persecuted for the cause of Christ every way he turned. And yet he could say, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands. Well, and I think of him writing to Timothy. And he makes it very clear that his departure is at hand. That body's going to dissolve. But the spirit returns to God who gave it and he looks beyond the disembodied spirit he calls it naked to be without a body and he says for in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven he yearned for the resurrected body well look what this body is undergoing for the cause of Christ and just through the normal processes of aging and problems that go along in life he says if so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked well, then I'm getting a little inside here. My body is clothing for the Spirit. And this is just living in a tent, but later, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. There's my permanent abode. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed. But you look beyond the unclothed state. And he says, but clothed upon. Here's what he looked for that mortality might be swallowed up of life. And then he says, Now he that hath wrought us for the self same thing is God, who hath given, us, given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Then notice the, the confidence that we need. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are also absent of the Lord. And sometimes we may forget where this passage is. Uh, is found in the context it resides in. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, Paul says, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. We don't know about the departure from this body, but I know it'll be me leaving. It won't be me staying. And I'll be leaving my temporary dwelling place. And I know that I'll be present with the Lord. You say, how, how, how's that going to be possible? the way anything else is possible with God because He is God far above us. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of Him. And immediately He launches into this fact that all too many don't want to think about. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in His body according to that He hath done whether it be good or bad. And then this is what was always on Paul's mind and on every faithful child of God's mind as they labor to teach the gospel to the lost. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. I think you get the idea that if you read it closely, that day by day, Paul thought about his departure. Paul yearned to be with Christ. Paul recognized that his duty was to do what an apostle should do on this earth, and thus he wanted to be here doing it. Yet it was always upon his mind, and I think also among faithful Christians at that time it was on their minds. Now if you go back over to 1 Corinthians 15, Paul has answered questions they wrote him, and one of them had to do with matters of the resurrection. And I want us to notice part of what he had to say concerning that house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. If you notice, he has to deal with them on a very rudimentary in first principle way. And he begins in verse 35. 
1 Corinthians 15, 35. Paul was pretty plain because he wanted to be understood. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened or made alive except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased Him. And to every seed his own body. In other words, if you can understand the functioning of the natural world and how things work in a garden, then you will be able to at least have a proper understanding of the fundamentals of the resurrection. And he says, now understand, all flesh is not the same flesh. And he says, there's flesh of men, flesh of beasts, and flesh of fishes, and other birds. It's all flesh, but different. Then he talks about what we see in the air, so to speak. Heavenly bodies. He says, there's celestial bodies, bodies terrestrial. The glory of the celestial is one, the glory of the terrestrial is another. Well, the mountains and the streams and the lakes are beautiful. But... It's also beautiful when you look at the stars and the moon and so on. And he says it. There's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. But they're glorious. But they differ. Then he makes his application. Anytime you see that, therefore, wherefore, hence, our soul. And that's what you see in verse 42. He's drawing a conclusion based upon reasoning just done from the facts set out. So it also is the so also is the resurrection of the dead. Well, thus I should be able to compare these things and get some idea of the body that Paul wanted, that house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. Now mark it, please. The it remains the same. Notice that. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Not a different it. Same it. It is sown in dishonor. It, same it, is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. That same it's raised in power. It's sown a natural body. Well, and this body goes in the ground or cremated, whatever. It's all going back to the dust from whence God made it, which God said it would. But John says we don't all it'll be like, we'll be like him. Paul's helping us here on this little bit. So on a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. And I know it's going to be a body fitted for heaven. That's what we have when John says we don't know what we will be like, but we will be like him. And he says, now you understand there's a natural body, things fitted for here. You ought to be able to understand then as it's fitted for here, this body, then there's going to be a body that he's going to receive when we're raised that's going to be spiritual, fitted for eternity. And so it's written, the first man Adam was made a living soul, the last man Adam made a quickening spirit. And that's Christ. He makes us, or will make us, what we will be in the resurrection. All will hear his voice, they that have done good in the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil the resurrection of damnation. Someday the Lord will call us out of the grave, as it were. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. In other words, the natural, this body, this skene, this tent, this temporary dwelling place, we have it first. But when it's sown in corruption and like the bean that dies in the ground, it sprouts. And look at the difference in what comes up from a shriveled up old seed from what you put in the ground. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. That's us. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. That's the will be. That's Paul looking for that body in the resurrection. And as, look how positive this is. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, as we are now, 
we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery that which has not been revealed. I'm about to reveal it. Now that should have us standing on tiptoe to say, we're going to see something the Holy Spirit's going to show us has been seen before. That's what Paul said. He says, we won't all sleep, we won't all be dead when the Lord comes back. But we shall all be changed. I saw that one time put on a nursery wall. We shall not all sleep, we all shall be changed. I think there's a little more to it than that. But notice it's going to happen so rapidly. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Now, most people think that that uh, twinkling is a blink of an eye. It's not. It's the sun that goes across the wet portion of the eye and that fast. You can't. There's no way to, to prepare for it. There's no way to get ready. You're just like this one moment and the next moment you're otherwise. For the this corruptible must be put, must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Totality, that's what he means when he says, and we shall be changed. This is at the end of time. So when the corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Therefore, death to the faithful child of God has lost its sting. Why? Because of our belief and obedience to Christ and faithful life in the church, the spiritual body of Christ. And if we walk in the light as He is the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin, 1 John 1, 7. That's why. Because we're looking for the house not made with hands, we've left the corruptible skene or tent, a temporary dwelling place fitted for this world. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And of course we quote verse 58, but it means a whole lot more when you see it in its context. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That's not if, ands, or maybes. That's no. Again, you can stand on it. And just as the children of Israel with covenant, with their covenant with God, could know they would be able to inherit the land of promise, I am quite certain that every faithful child of God, when it comes to the day of their departure, and there is before them the rolling of death, we'll call it Jordan. I'll not have to cross Jordan alone because I'm a priest a child of God as is true of every member of the Lord's church and when my feet touch the rolling waters of the Jordan of death I'll cross on dry land and so it's promised all those who love the Lord and love His appearing and love God with all that they are. I want to close with this one verse, Second Thessalonians. Therein we see that this is given, I started out with it actually. In verse 7, Second Thessalonians 1, comfort offered in all error and evil and wrong being made right at the coming of our Lord. When we are rejoicing in this resurrected body in the presence of God, listen again to what he said. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Now he had said concerning the dead in the first epistle, in 1 Thessalonians 4, as he describes the end of time, 
He says in verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Here's the reason, prime reason. There could be other reasons, but in my mind, the prime reason for this lesson to my brethren. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Verse 18. Words can comfort, but these are the words of the Lord. They are tried. They are true. And we can stand on the promises and know they'll be fulfilled. If you're not a child of God this morning, we urge you, we beg you, we plead with you by the mercies of Christ and the end of time and the great judgment that you believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, that you turn to repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be buried with your Lord in baptism for the remission of sins. As a child of God, if you've let these things slip, be focused on the here and now to the exclusion of the eternal, the unseen. We beg of you to renounce those things and handicap you in repentance. Confess them and pray God for forgiveness. And why not do so now while we stand and sing?